Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Dr. Yale Bin Tal. Yale completed her bachelor's degree and thesis at the University of Auckland, where her work was focused on mechanistic aspects of copper-catalyzed dehydrogenative cross-couplings. She subsequently came to the University of Edinburgh, where she completed her doctoral work in the group of Professor Guy Lloyd-Jones. Currently, she's a postdoc in the group of Professor Marcel Utz at the University of Southampton. And from there, I'll hand the floor over to you, Yale. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, Matthew. Thanks very much for that introduction. And thanks again for inviting me to talk on your show. Today, I'm going to be talking a bit about some work I've done during my time in the Lloyd-Jones group, looking at the kinetics of a dual nickel and iridium photocatalyzed cross-coupling. As a brief introduction, what is dual transition metal and photocatalyst cross-coupling? So in the broadest strokes, it's basically bringing together two molecules using the combination of a transition metal catalyst, most commonly nickel, and a photocatalyst that's been activated by visible light. And specifically today, I'm going to be looking at a cross-electrophile coupling, which is, in my opinion, one of the most exciting avenues that this new methodology has been able to open up for us. So this is a very exciting field. In less than a decade since the first dual nickel photoredox reactions were discovered, hundreds and hundreds of similar reactions have been developed. But while we've got this big onslaught of new ways to make molecules, the mechanisms of these types of reactions are still relatively unexplored. And particularly, there have been very few kinetic studies that have been done on these kinds of reactions. And so at the start of this project, we set out to conduct a detailed kinetic study on a dual photocatalytic and nickel catalyzed cross-coupling. Now, specifically, we wanted to use NMR spectroscopy to monitor these reactions. NMR is a very powerful tool for reaction monitoring, but any of you who've seen an NMR spectrometer will know that these are really big magnets with a very dark, narrow bore on the inside. And so monitoring a photochemical reaction specifically, which needs light to operate, by NMR is not trivial. So the first thing we had to do at the start of this process was build an apparatus that would let us do this. And you can see the schematic of it up here on the screen. Monitoring photochemical reactions by NMR requires specialized techniques that aren't yet commercially available. Our particular setup uses a fiber coupled LED connected to a fiber optic cable. The other end of this fiber optic cable has been treated in such a way that light radiates out evenly from the end. And this is placed within an amber NMR tube containing the reaction solution and held in place by a quartz coaxial insert. Once assembled, the entire tube is placed through the magnet into the NMR probe, and both the spectrometer and the lights are controlled by the same trigger switch allowing us to turn the lights on and start monitoring the reaction simultaneously. So once we had this apparatus assembled, we started studying this model reaction in particular. So this is a cross-electrophile coupling. We're reacting an alkyl bromide with an aryl bromide using an iridium photocatalyst, a nickel precatalyst. As well as these two catalysts, we're using one equivalent of this bulky silane and two equivalents of 2,6-lutadine as a homogeneous base. Once the reaction is assembled, we irradiate it, and the reaction is over in about 30 minutes. And we're forming this cross-coupled product up here on the right. So we had this reaction, we monitored everything by fluorine enamer, and we're able to get concentration time plots that look something like this. So we can see the consumption of both of our starting materials, you can see the growth of our cross-coupled product, and you can also see the growth of several different side products that are formed during this reaction. So we've got coupling of the aryl bromide to the solvent, and we've also got proto-debromination of the starting aryl bromide. In addition to all of these products being formed, we've got something else that would normally be sitting around the baseline, so I've put it into its own little insert graph, and that's the growth of this intermediate species here. So we've got a species that grows up, hits a steady state plateau, and then decreases and vanishes at the same time as the reaction hits completion. And we were able to assign the species as this aryl nickel complex that you can see here. We were able to synthesize it independently and show definitively that this is what we're actually observing. <laughs> 
And now that we've observed the major nickel resting state during the cycle, we wanted to probe in a bit more detail what exactly it's doing over the course of this reaction. And so to do this, we used some isotopic labeling studies. So we synthesized a carbon-13 labeled version of our starting arrow bromide, where the carbon-13 is on that CF3 position. Now, if you compare this to the normal non-labeled molecule, they're essentially chemically identical. There's only one isotopic substitution very far away from the active site of the molecule. So they're going to react in the same way. But they're not magnetically identical to each other. So if we take a fluorine enamara of this, you can see that our non-labeled substrate is one singlet in our fluorine enamara. But once you've got that carbon-13 in there, you split the fluorine into a broad doublet. And this difference in the fluorine enamara is going to carry forward to anything that's formed from this aryl bromide. So that intermediate species and all of the various products that we can observe, each of them has now a way for us to distinguish between a labeled and a non-labeled version that are chemically the same, but still different from each other. And using this molecule, we can do some very interesting studies. The first thing that we did was we made a one-to-one -one mixture of the nickel species and the carbon-13 labeled aryl bromide. When you mix these two things together, nothing really happens. But what we discovered was that if you've got the photocatalyst just as a catalytic amount in the solution, and you irradiate it, suddenly what we observe is this isotopic scrambling. So we start off with labeled aryl bromide, but we're starting to generate non-labeled aryl bromide, and the label is jumping onto the nickel species. You can see this very clearly in graphical format. So what we've got here is a graph with time on the bottom axis. We begin irradiating at zero. You can see that in the time before we start irradiating, there's no change. Once we turn the lights on, we can see that the amount of carbon-13 in our labeled species drops, and the amount of carbon-13 in the nickel species grows in until it's a one-to-one -one mixture, so we end up at about 50% of each of them. Following on from the study, we wanted to monitor exactly what the nickel was doing in the catalytic cycle as a whole. And to do that, we used our carbon-13 labeled substrate, and we did what we call an isotope entrainment experiment. In this experiment, we reacted the carbon-13 labeled aryl bromide substrate with the alkyl bromide under typical reaction conditions, with the exception that we used the preformed formed nickel intermediate species as our nickel catalyst. And what this lets us do is it lets us probe what the nickel is doing in the cycle. So as an example, let's take a very typical mechanistic cycle where we've got our aryl nickel species as an on-cycle intermediate. As I've just shown you, we know that there's an equilibrium going on between the aryl nickel species and the aryl bromide. And then the aryl nickel species can also react to a kick out product and regenerate the cycle. In this case, it's an on cycle intermediate. If we run the reaction and monitor how much carbon 13 is in each of these three species as the reaction progresses, we end up with a graph like we can see here on the bottom left. Your x-axis is percentage conversion. Our y-axis is how much carbon-13 is incorporated in each of these three species. So at the start of the reaction, there's no carbon-13 in our aryl nickel intermediate. There's full carbon-13 in our aryl bromide starting material. As we start running the reaction, we've got the equilibrium we already saw before. So what happens is some carbon-12 feeds back into the aryl bromide substrate pool which is why we can see that drop down to 90%. And we're both feeding in labeled product to the aryl nickel species, and we're forming more of it anyway as we're converting it into product. And so we form more and more carbon-13 in the aryl nickel. Now, the carbon in the product is going to directly follow on from what's in the aryl nickel. So the very first cycle of turnover, all of our aryl nickel intermediate is from carbon-12. So all of the product that we form is also going to contain carbon-12. But as the reaction progresses and more and more carbon-13 feeds into the aryl nickel, that's going to follow into what it is in the product. And so slowly we're going to make more and more carbon-13 labeled product until by 25% conversion, we've got almost the same ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13 in all three species. Now, imagine a second scenario where this time the aryl nickel species, instead of being directly on cycle, is just the main resting state, but it's a reservoir of nickel. And the actual active species is a much smaller fraction of the nickel present in the reaction.
This scenario is still consistent with all of the experimental observations we've made up until this point. But in this experiment, the same kind of analysis that I've just talked you through in scenario one reveals a very different looking graph, where this time the product is initially formed from carbon-13 rather than from carbon-12. And so this provides a really helpful tool to be able to distinguish between these two scenarios. And when we ran this reaction in real life, this is the kind of data that we got. So you can see very clearly that the aeronical species that we observed right back at the start is a true intermediate and not an off-cycle nickel reservoir. We then did what I'd describe as a more classical kinetic analysis. So looking at the reaction, coupling an alkyl bromide with an aryl bromide using an iridium photocatalyst, a nickel catalyst, a silane and a base and light, we generate our cross-coupled product and both of those side products that I talked about before. And now we did the systematic variation of each of the seven components during this reaction, and we monitored how that affected the rate of reaction, as well as the rate of formation of our main product and the two major side products. As an example, let's look at what happens when we vary the silane. So on the left is a plot of five overlaid kinetic profiles where the only difference between these reactions is how much silane is present. This is a plot of the consumption of starting aryl bromide as a measure of the overall reaction rate. And you can see that this doesn't really change as we vary the silane. On the other hand, the formation of each of the three products, so the cross-coupled product in red, the solvent-coupled product in gray, and on the far right, the protodebrominated product in green, you can see that those are very dramatically changed by changing the silane. And more than that, we can see that they change in different directions. So the cross-coupled product and protodebrominated product, both of them, the rate of formation of them increases as we increase our silane. On the other hand, as we increase how much silane is in the reaction, the rate of formation of our solvent-coupled product in gray decreases. So we can see that there's a step in the reaction that occurs after the rate controlling process that nonetheless really deeply affects the partitioning of this reaction into our desired product and into our side products. And we can see this again if we vary the alkyl bromide. So again, you can see that there's really not any impact on changing how much alkyl bromide we use on the overall rate of the reaction. And this time you can also see that it doesn't really seem to change what's happening with our solvent coupling formation. On the other hand, it's affecting the formation of both of the other products, uh, so our desired cross-coupling product and the protodebrominated side product. And again, you can see that they're being affected in different directions. So again, the alkyl bromide plays a role in the reaction after the rate limiting step that doesn't affect the overall rate, but it does affect the rate of formation of side products. And I'm not going to show you the data for all seven components. If you're interested, please check out the supporting information of the paper you can see on the top right. But after we've done this kind of analysis, we can think about it in this schematic that you can see here. So we can see red is the effect on the rate of reaction, and blue is the effect of the selectivity of changing all of the components here. And we can see that the light, the iridium photocatalyst, the nickel catalyst, and the aryl bromide all have an effect on the rate and not on the selectivity. And the silane and the alkyl bromide, as I've just shown you, have an effect on the selectivity, but they don't have an effect on the rate. And we can take all of this analysis that we've just looked at, and we can start putting those pieces together to start understanding how it is that this reaction comes together. So I'm going to show you this analysis in flowchart form. I appreciate that for a lot of you, this is not the way you're used to looking at reactions. And I promise, bear with me, there will be a conventional mechanism at the end. But I just find that this flowchart form is a much easier way of wrapping your head around the order of events that things happen in and the kind of logic that we used when putting all of these pieces together. So this is a photochemical reaction. The way it gets initiated is when light enters the reaction vessel. Now this is the first point of divergence on the flowchart, because in this reaction vessel is the big iridium photocatalyst, but the nickel intermediate is also present. And this is very brightly colored, so they both absorb in the kinds of light that we're using to irradiate the reaction. In fact, you can look at the rate of this reaction at different wavelengths, and the reaction rate is different, 
And the difference in the reaction rate is directly related to the extinction coefficient of each of these complexes at their wavelengths. And in fact, you can plug that into the Beer Lambert law and do a calculation of what you think the difference in rate should be. And we measure a sevenfold difference in rate and we calculate a sevenfold difference in rate. So the first thing that happens is that the light can either be absorbed by the iridium complex and go on to do something productive, or it can be absorbed by the nickel intermediate that's present and just not really do anything. So this is the first effect on the rate of the reaction. Now, once the light has been absorbed by the iridium, we've got a second process that goes on here. And this is essentially just basic photophysics. So your light is absorbed by the iridium. It goes to an excited state. There are a wide variety of photophysical relaxations that can go through. Or it can interact with a quenching molecule in solution to either do an energy transfer process to it or an electron transfer process. And because of the effects of different species have on the reaction rate, we've figured out that the quencher in this is very, very likely the arrow nickel intermediate species. So once the energy from that light has been transferred onto the nickel complex, we now have a decision between whether it's going to undergo the arrow bromide recycling process that we looked at earlier. So that's that exchange with the arrow bromide in solution and the arrow bromide that's on the nickel that we saw earlier. And that uses up some of the energy because you need the photocatalyst for it to happen. Or the reactive force that's been transferred onto the nickel complex can carry forward to the next stage of the reaction, which is now going to be distinct from the rate limiting processes. So the rate of the reaction is going to be determined by these three processes, which means that the rate is determined by the light, the arrow bromide and the nickel by means of the arrow nickel bromide intermediate and the iridium photocatalyst and unaffected by anything else in solution. And now we've got the second part of the reaction process, which is decoupled from the rate determining steps. And these are the partition determining sequences. So once that arrow nickel species has been taken off the rate determining cycle, it can either react with solvent to form solvent coupled product or be carried forward reacting with the silane. And then it can either pick up a proton from somewhere in solution or react with the alkyl bromide to make the desired cross coupled product. And the selectivity is going to be determined by these last two steps. Instead of writing it out in this flowchart like this, we can convert it into a more traditional reaction scheme, which is essentially doing the same thing. So here we've got interaction with the light right at the start. That gives us an excited state iridium, which relaxes down into ground state iridium or can interact with the arrow nickel bromide intermediate. That can either kick out arrow bromide and recycle itself, or it can move away from the rate determining part of the cycle onto the product determining part of the cycle, where it can either react with solvent or silane, or react with alkyl bromide or arrow bromide. And now at this point, I want to stress that while this is a much more traditional mechanism, it's still very abstract. Reaction with solvent to kick out arrow solvent is likely taking place over multiple steps. Uh, same for all of the other interactions going on here. But this is the simplest possible model that still lets us describe all of the kinetic properties of the system and avoids us making claims that we can't back up completely with evidence. And we can take this catalytic cycle and we can express it as a series of rate equations and model that mathematically and compare that to experimental data. So I've picked out two examples here. And what you can see here is that the model fits the experimental data really, really nicely. And I've picked two examples, but we've got 35 in total, and they all fit generally really well. So we can be pretty confident that the kind of analysis that we've now done does really fit the model that we've got. Also, as a point of clarification, this is not the only model that we looked at. We looked at quite a large array of other ones, and none of them could fit the kinetic data anywhere near as nicely as this one can. So this is the model that we've developed, and I just want to make a few notes about what this is and what we can and can't claim with this model. So as I alluded to before, the model is very abstract and it's deliberately agnostic about a lot of the details of the chemistry. So it makes no claims about whether there's an electron transfer process or an energy transfer process between the excited state iridium and the arrow nickel species because we can't differentiate between them based on the evidence that we do have. 
On the other hand, it's a very, very useful framework for distinguishing between mechanistic proposals that have been proposed and that will be proposed in the future, because to be a viable mechanism, it needs to be able to fit in with the kinetic structure that we've observed about the dynamics of the system. It's also a very useful guide for reaction optimization. So just looking at this, you can see that if you want to make sure you've got as much cross-coupled product as possible, you want to have an excess of alkyl bromide and quite a lot of silane. In terms of the rate of the reaction, that's slightly more complicated. As we saw before, increasing the concentrations of your catalysts positively affects the rate up to a certain point, after which at best it doesn't have any more impact and at worst slows the rate down because putting too much nickel in means that that nickel intermediate is now directly competing with the photocatalyst for input from the line. So as we reach the end of my talk, I'd really like to thank all of you for your attention and for Matthew for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. I hope you found this useful and perhaps more interesting than reading a paper. I hope that you've learned some things not only about this particular reaction, but also about the kinds of approaches that we use when we're looking at these really complicated reaction systems. And if you're interested in this kind of kinetic mechanistic analysis, I really strongly suggest you check out other work by the Lloyd-Jones group. I think you'll find it quite interesting. And finally, I do really need to acknowledge everyone in the Lloyd-Jones group, and particularly my supervisor Guy. I also should acknowledge the University of Edinburgh for funding and for hosting our lab. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Yale for joining us to share your work. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time!